All right. All right. So this, tech, this talk is going to get a little technical. Um, so how many coders do we have in the audience? How many code monkeys? OK, cool. All right, awesome. That makes me feel a little bit better. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll go through some stuff. Uh, it's going to be pretty quick. It's only half an hour. Uh, so I'm going to go through some stuff kind of fast. But feel free to catch me, or we can discuss more. And the code is on GitHub. I'll just let you guys know ahead of time. Um, yes, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. OK, so quickly about me. Uh, my name is Vinny Da Silva. Um, I'm Right now, I'm consulting with uh, my own little company called Mountain Sea Studios. Um, I've done mobile, PC, and VR games in the past. I have about 10 years of enterprise. So some of my sort of ideas of, of writing code is sort of from that sort of perspective of um, that sort of engineering discipline. All right. So just to start off, right, the talk's called Static Code Analysis. So what is it? Um, if any of you guys have ever done any sort of web development, uh, you guys have heard of Lint for JavaScript. Uh, there's a ton of other, you know, if you use uh, TypeScript, there's, there's TSLint. So essentially, what it is is that it's some kind of a tool, some kind of tool that will go through your source code and look for patterns for things that are either not a best practice, sometimes it's not a style, it's like it's not uh, adhering to a style or um, anything like that. And um, yeah, so that's essentially what it is. So uh, dynamic analysis is more like the profiling, and I'll get a little bit into that later. But yeah, so we're talking about something that will look at your source code and try to give you some amount of, of feedback ahead of time. And why should we care, right? And the reason why we care is that we all have abundant times for games, right? We, we all have unlimited uh, budgets, and, and nothing's ever late, right? Uh, and the, the packages we get in the store are always perfect. They never have any bugs or any issues, right? Clearly, I'm being facetious, but um, so that's what, that's what it is, right? We're, we have limited amount of time, and sometimes every tool that we can have in our tool belt that will help us along might be beneficial. And it won't be for everybody, but you know, maybe you, after this talk, you guys will, will think about it a little bit and say, hey, you know, this is something I can probably use in my project. So before I kind of go forward, so I'm going to go back in time, and I'm going to go back in time to July 26, 2016, and uh, Josh Peterson from Unity uh, wrote this uh, blog post, and um, it's pretty specific. It's about IL2 CVP um, optimization, and a specific topic. There's a, there's like three or four of them uh, called the virtualization. So, uh, how many people here have seen it? Okay, how many people here know exactly what it is, and remember it? OK, so as I, as I was saying, it was less and less hands, right? And that's, that's kind of the point, right? Um, and this is the TLDR for, for you guys who want to know. Um, if you guys have an, some kind of abstract class, um, make sure you seal it, especially if you're targeting iOS. OK, uh, so the, the point of this is that um, Documentation is awesome, right? People write blog posts. There's, if you look, especially for Unity, if you do a Google for optimization, there's tons and tons of information out there. And the way that I see it is static code analysis is, is, an, is an executable recommendation, right? So when you look at a blog post or an article, that's a textual recommendation that you have to remember and store away. And while static code analysis might be the opposite, where it's something that you, you don't have to necessarily think about all the time, but it'll execute it and it will let you know if it's a problem. And there's tons of potential in there, right? You can sort of build it into your workflow. You can have it inside of your IDE. You can have it part of your continuous integration process, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and if you use Visual Studio, especially in 2015, you probably already use it, right? It's the little squiggles that you see, and it'll tell you that um, you, know, you might be introducing a potential issue. If you use ReSharper, you already drank the Kool-Aid. I'm not really sure why you're here. Um, but neither of those are specific to Unity, right? And that's, that's the, um, sort of the, the, the nugget of what we want to get at. Um, and this is a quick example. For those of you who are not familiar with um, VS 2015, uh, this is just letting us know that a property that we're about to use could potentially be null. And if it is null, we're going to throw an exception. So you might want to check for it, right? So uh, if you didn't write that particular um, uh, object, you may not know that it might be potentially null. So the fact that it's letting us know is, is really helping us out, right? It's a tool in our tool belt. Um, but before I kind of continue, so it's going to be like the second tangent, but I swear I'll get back on track. Um, programmers have a tendency of being opinionated. Um, 
And, uh, <laughs> and, and what, I, what I try to say is that, you know, you, and here's a tip, a pro tip for you guys, especially if you guys are new to conferences, right? If you're networking, don't bring up religion, don't bring up politics, especially nowadays, and don't bring up tabs versus spaces. Um, they won't like you. And um, I know there's a lot of coders, and I'm about to upset a lot of you. This one slide will absolutely upset 100% of you. <laughs> right? I, I pissed off somebody here. But that's my point, right, is that we're opinionated, and what I'm going to try to stay away from is this idea where uh, sometimes, some, some th sometimes things are semantics, and it may not add a lot of value to your project. And I'd like to focus on the things that do add value. And uh, part of the reason why I'm kind of going to this tangent is that there's a lot of, um, a lot of projects, a lot of code analyzers out there that will look at code styles. And then I've worked with teams before, they're like, I don't want somebody telling me how to write my code. I'm going to write you know, underscores, or I'm not going to write underscores, or whatever. Um, or I'm going to have my, my, if, my, my brackets in the same line. Um, I don't find that to be incredibly valuable, right? It's a discussion that you kind of keep going, um, and it's just not going to get you anywhere. But the way that I see it is that static code analyzers do provide value. Um, and while you may not agree 100%, it doesn't mean it, it adds no value. And I think that's the part that I really want to get at, right? Is that um, there might still be something beneficial. Okay, now back to the future. Um, and I came to the conclusion, okay, I think Unity developers might be able to use a tool like this. And then I started to ask myself, like, what would I want from such a tool? And I sort of made a list. And the, the top of the list is warns, warns about potential issues specific to Unity. Uh, I wanted to be able to run it inside and outside of Visual Studio because sometimes I'm not, I'm not in Visual Studio. And um, I, so I wanted something I could run in, in the command line. I wanted useful reports, um, especially when I was wor if I'm working with other teams. I wanted to have something that I could show them that was easily readable, so that way they can sort of take that information and think about it and like, you know what, maybe we should tweak something or maybe this will be a performance issue later on. And um, this is mostly from feedback. Um, everybody that I, that I talked to about this wanted this to run on, on Mac. So that's something that I think will eventually happen, but it's not there yet. Rosalyn. Uh, so, uh, if you guys are at all sort of C-sharp folks, you guys probably know about um, Rosalind. And the, it's actually really, really cool. And if you have some free time, I suggest you guys take a look at it. Rosalind is a C-sharp compiler that Microsoft open sourced a little while back. And what's awesome about it is that you can query your code in code. It's, it's kind of meta, but it allows you to look at syntax, it allow you, allows you to look at semantics, and I'm not going to go into the details specifically of Rosalind, because that's going to be a whole other talk. Um, if you're interested at all, come, let's, let's chat. But the, the nugget that I want to get at is that it allows us to look for specific code patterns. We can query the code, and we can look for certain things, and then uh, you know, we can look for some things that are not good practice. Uh, and it includes analyzers out of the box. Um, and it's also integrated into Visual Studio. So once you create an analyzer, you can have Visual Studio sort of take advantage of it. So I went ahead and I built my first Rosalind analyzer. And what I did was I built a really simple one uh, that looks for um, any sort of find sort of methods, get component methods inside of an update function, which is generally, and I'm using generally just because I want to start new flame wars, accepted as not good practice, right? You should not do that ever. Um, and it would run from a CLI. But before I, I started like building my own thing from scratch all over again, I wanted to say, hey, are there any open source projects out there already that, um, that does this, right? I mean, why am I going to make something from scratch when I can contribute to it, especially when it's open source? And on GitHub, uh, I found a oddly named Unity Engine Analyzer. Um, and it, uh, it was already there and included a bunch of the things, the things, the check boxes that I was looking for, um, you know, but it lacked any sort of this, be able to run it from, from the command line. It had no reporting, it had no multi-platform, and it would require Visual Studio. So I started working on it and contributing to it, and I started checking off some of those boxes. Um, and right now we're up to 11 analyzers, and we're, we're sort of, I'm adding them as, as a go, but if you guys come up with any ideas, feel free to uh, send a pull request and let, let's chat more. And then one of the things that I wanna, really want to do is make sure that it runs on the, the new .NET, um, .NET Core stuff that will run on any platform. Um, and these are, this is what we have right now. So we have, we look for tag comparisons, we look for find um, methods and update, and it's also recursive, and we'll get into that a little bit more. 
look for empty mo mono behavior methods for each. Uh, and there's uh, some things here that I don't totally agree with, but because it's not a project, it's a project I'm contributing uh, to, uh, they're there. Um, but that's sort of the idea, is that there's going to be some things that you find useful, some things that you don't, um, and then you sort of try to get the value out of it where you can. Uh, okay, so I'm going to hopefully not crash anything here, and I'm going to swap over and show you guys some stuff in action here. And I will, oops. Whoa. So I know that the font's hard to read and I thought I knew what I was doing. There we go. All right. Can you see that okay? Cool, all right. So uh, I'm actually in the wrong project, so all that work was for nothing. <laughs> actually, I'm in the right project, wrong file. Okay, cool, so you guys can see. Ooh, ooh. Okay, so, um, so for an example, uh, I wanted to use something that I was not gonna uh, hurt anybody's feelings. So I'm using um, an open source project by Microsoft called StealthBot for their image, um, image cup. Project. I'm not quite sure what the project's called, but um, it's something I found online that is free, and what I wanted to get at is right here. Okay, so you experienced developers are looking at this update method, and you guys see nothing wrong, right? But um, this is the analyzer under cover, so, and it's hard to read, but what that's telling us is that this method is eventually calling um, a get component call, and it's telling us what the get component call is. So at first look, when you're looking at this, even if you're pretty experienced, you may say, hey, there's nothing wrong with this from a performance point of view. But then if you go and you dig into it, you can say, hey, it does have a get component call and it's in the update. And then you can sort of make the determination of whether or not it's a real problem you need to fix or not. Um, and then, uh, you guys can't see that so well. So I'm going to build this and run it. Uh, it might be a little bit hard to see just because of the, the screen. So this is just the CLI tool running against that code live, and it's hopefully not going to crash because we're live. OK, and here we see, uh, it's hard to see, but just believe me when I say that there's three warnings up there, and it's letting us know of um, that warning about the, the get component call inside of the update. And it's letting us know that there's two um, empty mono behavior uh, methods. Uh, so that's the CLI, and then lastly, uh, there we go. This is a report, uh, and I can definitely zoom in here. Is that better? So here we can see the, the three different ones, and this is the HTML report, and it tells us what file the problems are on and what line it's on, right? So if you're running this inside of a, a continuous integration server, uh, you can either email this out or host it up on a web server or something, and then people can sort of look at it and then get information from this. Uh, right. Oh, lovely. Okay. Uh, so, yep, that was that screenshot. And then, so I just did screenshots of everything in case something went horribly wrong. I had something to show you guys. Um, this is another view inside of Visual Studio. If you guys are, use Visual Studio, um, there's a little pane that will show you all of your, your warnings. Okay, now, you guys are saying, oh, that's great. You know, you guys have some built-in stuff, but maybe I have a really unique situation or I know of a particular situation that I wanna look for. And that's when I started thinking about like, well, maybe folks would like to make their own Analyzer. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna write some code, and uh, I'm gonna do my best to uh, not mess up. And, okay, so, this, so essentially what we're gonna do is now we're gonna tie everything back. Um, we're gonna essentially write the analyzer that's gonna check for that same situation that Josh Peterson was warning us about back in July. And essentially what we're looking for is we're gonna look for any classes that are extending any extended classes, and we're gonna look for whether or not um, the, we're gonna make sure that, it's, that either the class is sealed or the methods are sealed. 
So this is the code for uh, the, the Unity Engine Analyzer. And I'm going to go ahead and start off by just creating a new class. And conceal derived class. So I'm just, um, what I'm doing right now is I'm just extending the class um, and, and extending a class called Diagnostic Analyzer. And then I'm just implementing the, uh, the members that I have to that are, that are base ones. And then just some using statements. Um, OK. So here we have our class. And uh, the two methods that we need to, you guys can't see this, can you? He's going to let me know these things. How's that? Better? OK. So we have, we have two methods that we need to override. The first one here is initialize, and that's going to be where we do all our setup. And the second one that we have is this supported agnostics. And that's going to let the system know, Rosalind know, what we're looking for. And um, in the, some demo magic here, I'm going to copy and paste some code, because I don't trust myself. But I'll walk through. So essentially what we're doing here is we just have, we're creating a diagnostic descript, um, descriptor, and we're giving information. So we're giving it an ID, we're giving it a title. The message format is what's going to get outputted to the user. Uh, and then we have some other categorization stuff. We can go into more detail if you'd like to, but I'm just going to kind of go through that pretty quick. And then first thing we're going to do here is make this setup here. And I'll go through it. Uh, so what we're doing here is an initialization, we're going we're gonna to let the Roslyn compiler know, the, the analyzer system, system know, that we're looking, anytime the, the code that we're analyzing has a class declaration, meaning we're, we're actually writing out the class declaration in C Sharp, we're going to call this callback. And the callback is called analyze class syntax. Now, you can ask Roslyn to let you know about anything. Like there's, there's a couple of those where essentially any time you call a method ever, you're going to call your, 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 um, your analyzer. Just be careful because you don't want to make a bottleneck, especially if you're doing something inside of Visual Studio. You don't want Visual Studio to spend a ton of time um, going through your code. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. So essentially here we're saying every time I see, there's a class declaration anywhere in the code, uh, we're going to run some, run some code. And then. Just renaming because I don't like OBJ. Um, OK, so first thing we're going to do in this code here is we're going to uh, cast. So context is a lot of information about the analysis. The node is the root node of the code chunk you're looking at. And the root node of what you're looking at is a class dec declaration because that's what we asked for in initialization. And then once we have a class declaration, and this is the part I think is really cool, right? We, we can just say, hey, is this class declaration derived? Now, these are extension methods just to make things a little bit um, easier. But we're essentially querying that class. Now that we know about it, like we're saying, hey, is this class derived? And if it is, then we're going to say, hey, is it sealed? Because if it's sealed, it's already been optimized. We don't really care about it anymore. Whoopsie daisy. And then what we're saying is, now that we know that our class is derived, meaning it extends something, and then it hasn't been sealed, we're going to look at all of its members. So we're looking at anything that's been declared in a class, and then we're filtering it by method declaration syntax, meaning is this thing declaring a method? And if it is, we're going to get a list of all those methods. And then over here, I like to make sound effects. Um, and then what we're doing is something very similar here. We're saying, hey, is this method, now, now that we know there's a method declaration, has this method been overridden, meaning it's extending something from, that, from the base class? And then if it is, has it not been sealed, right? And then very simply, we're creating a, uh, a diagnostics object, and then we're spitting it out to the reporter. And that's all built into the, anal to the Roslyn's analyzer system. Um, and essentially what it is, right, we're at the top, top of the, the um, top of this, Analyzer, we're saying we're, we care about 
uh, class declarations, and then once we, we're in the class declaration, we can start querying information about the code, learning more about it, and then find patterns that we, we want to report on. I'm just going to go back to this demo here. Um, and this here is um, the exact example that uh, Josh Peterson had talked about, where you have an abstract class anim animal, and then we have a abstract method, and then we're overriding it in two, in two places. So f from the IL2 CPP compiler's point of view, to speed things up, these should be sealed. Now, obviously, if you have a case where you, ex you have multiple, um, multiple cl uh, levels of, um, of uh, extension, or I forgot the exact technical term, but if you have multiple levels, um, you, you may want to not leave it sealed. So that's an exception that you may want to be OK with. Um, so let, let's go ahead and rerun the analyzer. And it's going to take a little bit to compile. And if the demo gods are with me, it will show up. It's the moment where I hold my breath. Should have probably planned to have a slide while this thing was compiling. There we go. Whew, it worked. Oh, I think it worked. Let's see. OK, cool. Um, so even though you guys can't probably read it, there are two extra warnings, letting us know that we have a method that has not been sealed from an extended class, a derived class. And then if we were to seal these guys, or when we run it, we'll compile again. So I'll let that run, and I'll start getting started on the rest of the stuff. Oh, that was fast. Oh, because I didn't have to recompile. Um, and so, and they're gone. So now we're back to three. So that, that's sort of that feedback loop that we're looking for is that, hey, there's something wrong with the code. You just introduced it. We analyzed it. We found something wrong. Let the developer know. Developer goes and fixes it, and it runs it again. And then you're, you're, you're improved. You've avoided a potential landmine. And so just wrap things up a little bit here. OK. Um, so yeah, so I just showed the, um, how, to make a, how to make an analyzer and how to go into that stuff. And the thing that I'd like to mention is that um, it doesn't mean that you don't profile your game or you don't profile your app. Um, you, you still should. Um, there's still going to be things that you don't catch. Uh, and the, the cool, the, what, I, what I think is the, the real benefit to all of this is that if I'm writing a game and, I'm, and I profile it at the end and I find out, hey, you know, we should avoid x, y, and z, or you know, we should treat this way, you know, this object a certain way, if I, if I then write an analyzer for it, my next project, I won't have to think about that again, right? I can focus on something, I can profile something else. I can find another bottleneck. And even better is if the community starts sort of working together and sharing it. Because then, you know, what, what I found in my project might be able to benefit you and vice versa. <clears throat> and the other thing to worth, to, that's worth noting is that uh, Unity is always changing. And some stuff that's slow a couple of versions ago might be fast today and vice versa. So that's why it's also important to, to don't abandon profilers, right? That's not the point of, of, set of, of analyzers. Um, so you should still. Um, you should still continue profiling and getting that information. Um, and the other part of it is obviously code is only one part of Unity, right? You do so much of it in your scene editor um, and, and in the all sorts of editors, um, all the properties and all the tools. So you, you may have a situation where you might have a bottleneck that is not code related. Uh, so you still have to profile. And you're saying, oh my god, I'm, I'm awesome. You know, I, you know, I never write bad practices. Um, that may be true. I, it's hard to believe, but I, that may be true. Um, the, but you may be able to help other members in your team. 
And the other thing, too, is that especially if you're targeting different platforms, optimization changes, right? So that IL2 CPP um, optimization probably won't matter if you're targeting Windows. Um, so you know, you, if you're targeting multiple platforms, you might have to remember and learn all of the way that you optimize something for a particular platform. And that's not something I personally want to do. I'd just write, rather write code and work on mechanics and whatnot. And the other part of it is Unity changes, right? So it, you may not be on top of it all the time. Um, like I said, a bunch of people here don't rem doesn't remember that blog post. Um, so that's another what I feel is a benefit. Uh, don't if so if you're about to ship a project uh, a, a game, uh, don't use don't bother with static code analysis. Just profile because that's going to get you the the most benefit. Um, and the thing that I, I like to the, and the reason why I wanted to have a bunch of ways of running the analyzers is because tools are useless if they don't fit in your workflow, right? If you can't find a way to use the tool uh, in a way that's going to help you all the time, it's, it's really useless. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I feel like the, the more often you run it, meaning on a per build basis or if you put it in your CI system or something, that's when you're going to get the most benefit because you're getting a constant feedback. Um, and another part I want to talk about is in, with CI, right? So right, right now as it is, it's possible to run um, the analysis tool uh, with Azure Functions. I think it could run on AWS Lambdas. I'm not sure. But I think at that point, we might need to start working on more um, uh, compatibility with different uh, multi-platform. Um, and I think ultimately, what I'd like is a little bit more metadata around it. So that way, on a particular build, it tells you all of the, all of the items that, it, that you sort of, um, the analyzer picked up. And then you can sort of see any trends. Because sometimes the, num like the specific an um, analyzer report isn't really that useful. But if you're, sh if you're seeing a trend, it might show you something. So if you bring on a new developer, and then you start seeing that trend go up, they may, you, know, wanna, you might want to question you know, some of the things that they're doing. Or you might need to give them more training or something. So for, from the analyzer's perspective, um, there's, I feel like there's still a lot more work. We want to have Mac support, add more analyzers, make it more uh, useful. Um, and then I'm assuming at some point you know, we may want to look at how do we integrate this with other editors. Um, and then I think, I think one thing that's really important is that we're going to want to have a way to have specific platform targets. So that way we're not looking for um, we're not looking for potential bottlenecks in platforms that doesn't need it, right? So like I said before, I really don't care about L2CPP optimizations if I'm targeting Windows or whatnot. Um, OK, cool. So this is, the, this is essentially what we're talking about, right? Is uh, if we can prevent a problem before it happens um, or help have a tool give us that sort of um, that the feedback right away, it's really beneficial. And you know, just because I want to make sure that I'm inclusive to all cultures, um, I added that in there. <laughs> so uh, just to wrap things up, um, the project is uh, right now it's active. Um, and you can run this today. You can go ahead and do a pull request to grab the, um, the, latest, um, the latest release and run it. It will run inside of the CLI. Uh, you can also integrate it inside of Visual Studio. Um, but you know, I, I think right now 11 is not enough to have a lot of, um, I mean, there, there's benefit. Uh, I've run this on code of my past projects, and I was able to catch things that I didn't realize were there. Uh, and I was able to run it on, um, like sometimes I'll buy packages off of the store. And it's surprising how much weird code is in some of those packages. Uh, but you guys know. Uh, so anyways, any sort of feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, image credits so I don't get sued. And that is it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And um, I think we have time for questions. If anybody has any questions, or maybe not. Oh, yep, I'll go back. Yep. Um, right now, you point a project file to it, and it'll run. Yep. 
Uh, not right now, but um, that's a great suggestion. So, in, so the question was, can we suppress messages? And uh, the answer right now is, if you're in Visual Studio, you have all of that functionality, if you're in Visual Studio, but not from the CLI tool. The CLI tool essentially will report or anything that is a warning or above. Oh, and, it, and just if anybody's curious, it generates a JSON file, and then the, re the report works off the JSON file. So that way, if you have some kind of other tool and you want to sort of consume it that way, you can do that. <laughs> Okay, so the question was, um, this gentleman is looking for a tool that, uh, that's multi-platform that allows to check um, code styles and commenting, right? Uh, so the way that Roslyn is built is supposed to be multi-platform, so you should be able to run that on any platform. Uh, what I don't know right now is exactly if there's a, a tool that will launch it that's not in Visual Studio. I'm not sure, but it's not hard to write. I mean, I, I, I wrote a CLI tool for this, so if you're, if you want to talk more later, we can discuss it. Um, but there, are, I know there are uh, code styles that are built into Visual Studio that you can use. No, no, but they're but they're Roslyn. They're Roslyn now. Yes, you should be in, in theory. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you.